get started with the cool zone stuff today. Um, I basically have some ideas that I was thinking about stemming from the stuff I was talking about earlier. So this grain VDB, uh, VDB to spheres workflow is pretty powerful. Um, and then the, uh, the um, stuff I was playing around with the mountain or the cave uh, last week, last Friday. Um, so just doing the volume uh, and ISO surface and all that stuff. Vegan nuts, <laughs> how's it going? You came just in time, just when I was getting uh, officially started. Um, so you're just doing quite Q and A kind of stuff earlier and we're, we're just diving into the process now. Um, yeah, so, so basically doing the cave uh, stuff last week to density and um, then I was just doing the volume VOP to modulate the density inside of this volume and then uh, converting it to an SDF and eventually a, a surface to get like an abstract geometry. It's terrific. How's it going? So um, yeah, if we just do the volume VOP. So I think this time um, I'm going to go less less realistic. It's going to be definitely more abstract of just like a, a kind of 3D form or a 3D kind of uh, composition. So let's do the classic anti-alias noise. And then um, invert stuff. Whoa. <laughs> My typing is all off. Convert stuff to a VDB. Um, so I just do the traditional Houdini volume because it will basically, you're just defining a region, a 3D um, domain that you're, you're activating the voxels. With VDB to activate and deactivate voxels, it's a little bit more of a process. So I'll basically define like a 3D canvas or region that I want to work within and then convert to a VDB afterwards to uh, benefit from the VDB tools and just the optimizations and stuff like that, that that VDB offers. And then if you do like VDB visualize tree, this is an interesting way of, uh, let's go. <laughs> this is a good way to visualize the active voxels or stuff like that. So you, you could see even if you go to solid voxels or solid boxes, <laughs> voxels, uh, this is the way of visualizing the voxel size with the um, resolution of your volume. So if I increase sampling divisions, then we get more voxels and uh, smaller boxes. It's terrific. Thank you for the tier two. Let's go. <laughs> He's rich enough as it is. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's no way to navigate the current uh, government finance system without uh, making someone a lot richer. Yeah, I, even the Patreon, is. I, there's issues and all the stuff with that. So I don't know. Um. We can we can plot to overthrow Jeff Bezos as as we uh, continue building this community, and perhaps overthrow him one day. Can we bring a attribute in a vector attribute inside Redshift Shader Builder like point bop and compute length for shading? Usually, with that kind of maths, I don't. You can't really do it inside of the shader, so I'll do. Um, I'll just compute. The, the desired result on the geometry and then send that to the, the redshift render. So like in a traditional VOP, I would um, calculate the length of my vector and then store that as like magnitude or something and then use redshift to do whatever I want with that. So like with Mantra, you can do all that stuff or Karma, you could do all that stuff in the shader. But with Redshift, you kind of have to think of it more like a game engine or something like that, where you're baking down a lot more of the information that you need. Um, 
either to geometry attributes or even like baking it out to texture maps or stuff like that. Just send him your money per mail. <laughs> I'll set up uh, an OnlyFans for for uh, extra donations and subscriptions. So this is just a way to visualize um, the voxel size. This one we're converting from uh, a dense Houdini volume to a sparse VDB. And what I ended up doing last week or last Friday with the convert VDB um, keep it as a VDB, but then go from fog to SDF. And then this ISO value, basically you're saying any fog um, area of the volume that's greater than this value, treat it as a hard surface or, or a um, 3D surface, essentially. So any voxels that have a value above that threshold, it will enclose it in a surface. And, uh, oh yeah, I realized I missed that. Someone was mentioning the pragmatic VFX stuff earlier. That's a pretty interesting, um, I, I did look through the teaser video on that for Vimeo. Animatrix guy is super, super talented. He's put out a ton of, like, he was doing the um, OpenCL breakdowns and stuff like that before, like OpenCL programming within Houdini. So they have the OpenCL thing. And then this is really interesting. You could do any kind of like scripted um, geometry manipulation, but on the GPU, kind of like I do with the, the smoke solver, but you can do this to manipulate geometry uh, instead of just only being able to do it with the smoke solver like I do it. Um, so I think, I don't know if you have to save this as a separate text file, but there's, I think there's ways, yeah, you could set this up and just type in the code directly. But this is a super advanced thing because it's, you need to be typing like specific OpenCL um, programming language that's different than all the other programming languages in Houdini. But yeah, that Animatrix guy is super, super, uh, Talented. So I'm trying to make something here that's going to be a little bit more, um, less realistic, more abstract form. Um, I might knock back the roughness and just get like a more blobby, smoother kind of form. Um, whoops. Scattering, scattering bubbles in an ice cube and then subtract them or SDF difference. But when I was fracturing the cube and su subtracting spheres were a mess, they were acting like extra geometry inside. Um, I'm not sure which part of the process you were talking about, just doing the VDB to SDF. With those, Interior bubbles, um, I wouldn't worry about doing the SDF difference or doing any of that stuff. Um, I would just reverse the faces and then the renderer should know to treat them like air bubbles. It was kind of like that underwater um, bubble stream I did a while back. Where I had air bubbles or just like little hints of light and stuff inside of them. Um, I think there was a, a different flip workflow as well. So hopefully that that helps. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna do, sometimes I'll do multiply constant. Um, and then this just lets me change the 3D frequency with one node instead of, uh, instead of changing all three of those components and stuff like that. Alex, how's it going? <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Check it, just popping in to say hi. Using volume and then volume VOP to scatter bubbles in a noisy pattern. Yeah, I mean, so basically what I would say to do that, like if I wanted to put bubbles inside of this shape. Um, so with the scatter node, you can scatter it within 3D density. Um, like by default, when you scatter into volumes, it will do it based off of 
Um, then we go one more invert to go to polygons down here. Um, so depending on the resolution and stuff like that, this scatter node will try to put things within your uh, density pattern. Um, and then if I just do copy to spheres, copy to points with spheres, um, make them a lot smaller these would be kind of the air bubbles you could do special stuff to make the size have some variation and stuff in the size um, and then if you just reverse them you'll have to switch this to polygon so that you can actually have faces to flip around the primitive itself like it, you can't really reverse that because it's just a, a special kind of data type um, but then if you merge these together, then the render will know to treat the... Um, I would need to do something to get rid of this stuff on the edges. I, I did go through that in the, that stream a while back. Um, but basically when the render goes through this, the ray traces, then it hits like this backward facing surface and then a forward facing surface. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, like, basically I'm saying is I wouldn't ever try to subtract to, to actually do anything with these meshes. I would just do all that kind of, because basically the renderer is doing that Boolean or doing that uh, operation at render time. Um, so if you just don't try to do that step until you're rendering things, um, if it's possible, that's that's the way I would try to do, do it. Um, and then if it's... Uh, yeah, so you just have to manage, like if you're doing a fracture or something, you could basically, if you do like transform points or stuff like that, um, there's ways to apply the, the underlying simulation to this. Yeah, so I would try to do transform pieces, like you would need to get the parent's name attribute or stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit more of a technical approach in figuring out some things, but it should, make things a lot easier doing the boolean you you would need to like fracture or change topology every frame um it might mess up motion blur it, it just is a lot um more unstable of a workflow so if possible i would try to to do things um using this kind of method i'll just move this chain over here yeah, you just do transfer pieces. Um, you can maybe just do attribute transfer and give it the nearest name attribute, um, depending whether it's on point or primitives, and then uh, get it using the, um, you just do that. I think it's dot import to do create points to represent objects. Um, and then this would be your simulation uh, transform information. So then your bubbles, your interior stuff would just go along for the ride with your, uh, the same, to match the same performance or the same result uh, as your uh, like base RBD simulation. So just doing the low res to high res kind of workflow. Your simulation is your, your proxy or your um, optimized geometry. And then all this stuff is like the render time glitz and, and bells and whistles and stuff like that. So get back to this, um, basically I was just saying multiply constant. I just do this as a way to basically uniformly scale the size or the pattern of the 3D noise. You can as well go into this 3D frequency and do the same thing like that. Um, but I just prefer, you could visualize it as well. Like you see a little number here and you know the frequency without having to click on this node. Um, so it's just a, that's why sometimes I'll do extra nodes or stuff like that inside of a VOP network for, for noises. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Something like this might be kind of cool. Um, if you want to get rid of the edges or the border, um, you can just mask out that area. 
So maybe this relative to bounding box this is another classic go-to. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you for uh, all the advice. I'll look through your, your uh, Discord messages when I uh, get off the stream. Was said uh, you were trying to have a conversation with me on Discord. So are we going for some nebulas or star system with this setup? This is going to be more abstract, um, just uh, kind of 3D, like a plastic kind of geometry or something like that, I'm thinking. Um, basically, this is going to be like a plastic form or like a mold that uh, has made these 3D shapes or something like that. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of like, if you ever um, type in this zeitgeist, um, these people do like 3D geometry kind of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of, this is kind of what I have in my head is like some of this kind of uh, style of like plastics. Um, even this thing here is pretty cool. Um, that kind of 3D forms or kind of like meta ball plastic type of vibes. Um, so with this relative to bounding box, you just give it the position and the file. So file or op input, you're just saying to use yourself as the um, bounding box information. So if I go back to my volume here, we could visualize this bounding box information. Um, by default, this looks at um, the X component because it's basically this is giving you the X, Y, Z. Um, if you want to be a little bit more clear as to what's going on. Um, yeah, have a good night, CG Rockstar. <laughs> Sorry, this time zone here doesn't perfectly line up with uh, it's like 3, 8, 2 a.m. or something on, on your end. Um, so we'll do this vector to float. And basically this is just visualizing what was happening before a little bit more clearly. Um, if you want to look at other attributes, you can do that as well. Um, so this just goes from zero to one across the bounding box. And if I want to flip it, around so basically i'm trying to isolate the border so i can um, mask out my 3d shapes so that we don't see the edges of the um, canvas or the edges of the the bounds of the the volume um, that i'm working on isn't bb already the relative b box of the volume it might be <clears throat> i've had some some like disparities sometimes using this I don't know if it was just with um, VDB or, or ones like that, but usually I just use this one um, that's, I don't know, it's like a habit or whatever of mine, but it's possible you can use this one. Um, you might, yeah, so I'm just typically using this, so it's my BOP networks are compatible for VDB or, or dense volumes. Um, yeah, so we have the 3D noise, and I just want to mask this out at the edges um, to fade it or clip it out before it hits the the hard seams, essentially. All of these numbers go from zero to one across the, the different axis. Um, so if I just do subtract constant and just do 0.5, then this number will basically be um, centered at zero. So it should be going from negative 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5. Some more gems. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty technical right now, but we'll, we'll get into some in a, in a little bit, I'm sure. Um, so now if we do absolute value, we're basically going from 0.5 to 0.5 and zero in the middle. Um, so I've just remapped this to go from zero to one, and now we're going from 0 0.5, zero, 0 0.5. Um, and if I want to go multiply constant and double it, 
then one to zero to one. Um, and then if you do a power function, this will give you control over the um, radiation. You just don't want to go into negative numbers because that can mess things up. But um, basically I can bend these values uh, and just shape the, the fall off the way that I want to. Um, so what I can do here with my 3D information, the, the um, 3D noise is just subtract this value. So at the edges, it starts to mask it out. Um, what we've just done the X component so far, so we just need to do this a few more times for each additional um, axis. So if I just do two more copies of that, and we have X, Y, and Z that we're remapping, um, we can go back and visualize it. So we have X, Y, Z. And then if you want to combine um, all of this stuff, yeah, I think you would just add them. Um, that should be okay for what, what we want to do. So now we have the border, <clears throat> the 3D border. Um, if this bend turns into be a little bit of a problem, you might want to do maximum. Um, so that will just use the overlapping regions. And instead of uh, additively combining them, it will just use the higher value of whichever input. Um, so it avoids values from going above one, essentially. Added to, this add is like, um, so kind of just different like Photoshop operations or different ways to composite um, information together. So go back here and take a look. Instead of just X, we can do all the three different um, masks at the same time, the three different axes, X, Y, and Z. But you could also do this maximum um, I'm just going to go into this visualization at the end when we're going back to surface. It'll be a little bit easier to see what's going on. So we could try again switching between the two. Um, maybe this add is going to be better. It's just going to result in like a rounder shape. Uh, the max sometimes preserves hard edges. So for this, like I'm making a very blobby organic type of shape. So I just want to leave this as an additive to get kind of rounded edges. And uh, we could go up maybe a little bit more with our sampling divisions. You just kind of have this blobby uh, floating cloud kind of thing. Um, if we wanted to, this is like the classic thing that I was always doing was um, using another noise to distort or, or drive this kind of noise. So like, that's basically how you just make your, your noises look a little bit more unique or um, less uh, generic. So like if I add, combine two noise signals, um, then we're basically doing like this post, uh, result modulation. Um, that's one way you can do things. There's like hundreds of different ways you can combine these noises. Um, what I'm typically doing is just adding um, a 3D vector and then distorting the position before the noise runs. So warping it uh, in 3D space. This is kind of like a lattice, like you're, you're making um, just an imaginary lattice that's like twisting or doing some weird kind of uh, undulation type of thing to the to the noise signal before you generate the second noise. And then this one, I usually do it pretty smooth as well. And you want to play play around again with this frequency. So something like this, now we have it, is just a little more interesting than uh, we disable. This is like very generic. It could be metaballs. This could be something from, from 1980 or something like that. But we 
add in this little bit of distortion and now it just makes our, our form um, a little bit more complex. I think when I was like changing these values, it, it was starting to look somewhat interesting just doing, um, stretching the noise along one axis. You just get some, some oblong shapes or something like that. And then amplitude, this is basically the way we're using it is the amount of distortion we're applying. And then you can always just change the three offset. And this will just give you a new random outcome. If you use a big enough number, this is just like changing the seed, essentially. You're just saying like generate a new random pattern. If you just do this in smaller increments, then you are kind of like animating the offset and you can um, push the noise or evolve it along a certain axis or, uh, axis or direction. Um, I might switch to simplex. I think this might be enough to get started with right now. The main noise. Yeah, so one thing, sometimes you want to change. Um, sometimes you don't want to do these noises at the origin. Um, like if I just do a grid, just do it with a size of one. Um, there's always kind of like a weird artifact when you run the noise at zero, zero, zero in terms of offset. I'll just turn off my, my shading. Um, maybe just do like absolute value. Um, you can see that there's this weird kind of pinching stuff that's happening. And if you look close enough, you can see like the different octaves are starting to combine and give you this like repeating structure. Boom, boom, boom. That's getting bigger with each octave. Um, so if you just, and then like, especially if you change roughness, this will become m much more apparent. Um, you think it's just the scale point for each? Yes, yeah, so it's, um, it's basically just some underlying like process of the noise. Um, yeah, it's the scale point for each recursion level or basically like it should it should be related to these octaves. Um, even with simplex noise, you'll see it as well. Um, and if you just change your one of the components of 3D offset so that you're not basically generating the noise at the origin, um, then you can kind of work around this issue. Or, or now I'm just seeing more of a, a random kind of pattern. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good idea. I'll go back to the main generation. Um, it's kind of hard to see here because we're working in 3D, but basically in um, if you just sliced through this, you would see that same kind of like cross along uh, zero. If I just do a different offset here for um, this noise, then we're getting uh, just more of a natural pattern. And I might go into this ISO value here and then just look at like this is kind of the same idea as like dilating or eroding um, your noise. Kind of like expanding or contracting the, uh, the volume of the shapes. So I'm just gonna try to find a little bit more uh, interesting area of the noise. Who broke graduate student? <laughs> Thanks for all the gems. Yeah, it's just, just sprinkling. Oh my God. Thank you for the tier one. 
Thank you for the two months, vegan nuts. So maybe, I don't know, I might need a little bit more roughness or something. It's just everything's looking a little bit too, uh, too generic right now. Um, might also just go a higher frequency. So because I'm warping things, everything kind of has like a flow to it. Like it, it has this implied motion to it that's pretty nice. Um, that's another reason to do this kind of distortion. Otherwise, all this stuff appears very stationary. But doing this, oops, doing this layer of distortion gives it this kind of nice, like, you're kind of, it's the same idea as like advecting, because um, you're just shifting the uh, coordinate space based off of this, this original noise signal. So I might just do another multiply constant here. Um, to do the same <clears throat> idea with this uh, kind of warping noise or distortion noise. We just go lower, lower uh, numbers, and then we should have a more uniform direction. Like instead of seeing different swirls, everything should just be getting pushed in like a uniform um, direction. I don't know. I'm I'm a little suspicious of this uh, result. I think maybe it's better to have this uh, this number a little higher and uh, I might just play around with this don't I don't want to spend too long in the tweak zone too, too early um, I'm just trying to get a better uh, form to start working with Something like this could be pretty interesting. Um, the last thing we can do at the end here, if we just do multiply constant to our mask. So each, each axis we were fading out the um, borders. So basically the, the higher I multiply this number, the more uh, the mask will like fade out as, as we get closer to the edges. So if I want this thing to appear less boxy, um, might because all this stuff is like grid based it, it might not uh, work super well but we can at least fade it uh, a little bit further the analytic noises you're talking about the analytic curl noise yeah it's possible maybe just doing the length could be better um so we're already working at the origin we could try it and uh i don't think we really even need to remap maybe just scale the uh amount that we're subtracting things so this is basically just saying as we get further from the origin um decrease the value even more possible maybe doing like an ex exponential curve or a increase of it but something like this appears uh, less less uh, like a grid and more of just like this is 
occurring by itself. We do the curl noise, this analytic, and uh, use this to push things around. Oh my. <laughs> So for whatever reason, these I think the curl noise stuff is like a lot higher uh, of an amplitude. And uh, as well with the roughness, I'll usually turn that down. we we'll get away from the origin again. And uh, maybe just a small uh, amplitude. So the curl noise, you could read about it uh, online or do some research, but it, it's basically using a fancier method to construct something closer to the end result of like a fluid simulation. Um, so it basically forces behave more like wind or something like that, where it's pushing stuff and everything is kind of adhering to like, yeah, it's divergent free noise. Um, so basically, there it won't uh, shove stuff together. So it just appears more like a natural force that you would see in the real world. Uh, and then this noise doesn't really take um, natural like physics into account. It just gives you like 3D vectors to uh, distort things with. So I'm just reducing turbulence, checking out a smoother result. Maybe I think this is starting to look pretty cool. Let's do just reduce the ISO value to make stuff a little thicker. And uh What's your way to explain the difference within 3D and 1D noise signature? Looks like bones. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does look like, uh, I don't know, like fish, fish bones or something like that. Um, so 3D and 1D noise signature, uh, it basically depends what you're doing. But um, the easiest way to experiment with them and, and try out the two differences um, if you just look at the mountain um, node this basically uses a um, one-dimensional noise but it turns it, it it moves things in 3d space by um, moving stuff along the normal so inwards and outwards it will displace stuff by a, a 1d noise signal um, and then if you do this attribute noise and apply it to the, the position. Um, so we'll just add the 3D noise to the position and just center it all along zero. Um, this is more like distorting uh, the space, the, the shape with the 3D noise. So it depends what you're trying to create. Like this is more like you're moving something around with a wind or a force. Um, maybe changing this element size or something. Um, this is more of what I'm doing right now inside of the volume bop. And then this um, thing is the 1D mountain noise can be more useful for, like I was using it to generate the grain shapes. It gives you generally a pretty rocky kind of result because um, you're just pushing things in and out kind of more like a displacement map or a bump map or something like that. Um, this is more like a distortion or, or warping or something like that. So this is primarily why people would use the two different um, 3D noises, like the 3D versus 1D noise, I guess. And then as well, there's like a bunch of different noise types, but all of these are one dimensional results that it moves things along the normal with. And then these are typically 3D. I don't know if, I don't really, it's doing some weird stuff if you do it, if you set it to 1D, like I think it's just moving things in the X direction essentially. So it's just not something people usually do. Um, but yeah, that's hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. So this is like a wind or like a cloth or something's underwater um, getting pushed around. And this is more of like texturing or, or something like that, I guess is my, I don't know.
but yeah, I was doing um, this whirly noise and uh, something like that. You get like little crystals or, or grains or, or salt or something. Um, <clears throat> so it just depends what your intention is. So we'll go back to the, the dry bones. Bones. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try increasing the sampling divisions. So kind of like I was doing with the cave stuff last week. Um, when you start to get a little bit happier with your result, then you can move to a higher resolution. Um, like this stuff will take a little bit longer to process. So taking two seconds, uh, one and a half seconds to run this noise, um, you're basically not really, really working interactively anymore. Um, if I was to go in and change the results, I wouldn't want to wait a couple seconds just to see the changes you kind of want to work like in real time. So that's why I usually wait till the um, the end to boost these values. Like once I get something I'm, I'm happy with. That's kind of the benefit of working with procedural noises in general is that you can always move to a higher resolution um, at the end to start to get a little bit more detail. So even doing like if you're doing uh, displacement maps for, for rendering, you, instead of a texture map, you're limited to like that resolution. You do procedural noises, like the Maxon noises in, in Redshift are really cool. You kind of have like unlimited detail. Or it's, it's, the reason why those were invented is because of that. So I'm gonna crack open the uh, where, where did it go? VDB to spheres. And uh, this way, you need to give it an SDF. Like, I think if you just give it a fog volume, it won't really know what to do with it. Um, but if I give it the, the SDF with the surface, then it knows to put the spheres inside of uh, this surface. And uh, yeah, I was using this in the Grains YouTube tutorial. So it kind of revisited it. Um, they use it with different places in Houdini. It's really useful. Um, there was the um, new shelf tool they added that's like this VDB sphere proxy. Um, so you can even use this when you're doing an RBD simulation instead of um, doing the convex decomposition. Sometimes this is nice way to uh, represent like uh, convex holes, basically to, to create proxy geometry for the RBD solver to use to simulate stuff. The, they have this new shelf, shelf tool they added in Houdini 18. Um, I think some other, I don't know if they have it, but um, I think that there was a DreamWorks paper or something a while back that was, I don't know if it really ever got published. Um, but there was some interesting research that they had done in, in that, uh, in that area. Let me just type in one more thing. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. It was just a quick paper. I don't. I don't know if they ever really um, published it. If you were to set up a new PC rig, would you go the Threadripper over Intel? Uh, Kieran, the particle jumper, <laughs> was asking me this on Discord. It depends what you're trying to do. Like, certain for simulations, having less cores and higher. Um, clock speeds gives you the, the quickest results because um, a lot of those things don't multi-thread that well. But for like these VDB, like all the stuff I'm doing right now, if I had a thread ripper, it would be a lot faster because like any VOP or VEC stuff can multi-thread really easily. Um, and then all the VDB operations can uh, take advantage of all your, when I say multi-thread, I just mean take advantage of all the different cores of your computer. Um, so it depends what you're trying to do, but I think generally either just an Intel processor with more cores or um, 
yeah, if you need to fall back to mantra or if you're just like baking textures, it's it's nice to have. Um, so if I was to build one or in the future, oh, like I'll probably reevaluate. But uh, yeah, I think I would probably go with the thread ripper. All right, let me type in one more thing. Ah, I found it. Yeah, so DreamWorks released this breakdown a while ago that I don't think people really took advantage of, but basically they're doing this all this stuff with RBD um, simulations. So they're doing the VDB to spheres and then using constraints to simulate the flexibility of like wood. Um, so it's a lot faster than Vellum or FEM because you're you're able to use Bullet. Um, so the, using that same shelf tool, the VDB to Spears stuff, you can do a ton of uh, stuff really quickly. Then I don't think they ever released like the proper paper for this kind of stuff, but you can do all all kinds of really um, interesting stuff with that. We we'll put this in there if you guys want to take a look at that. So even this denting, like all, all kinds of uh, really cool stuff. Maybe, yeah, you could go to the link at the bottom of that. I guess that there is a paper and some other stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, this is another reason that VDB to Spears stuff is super cool. Yeah, so the way that I'm working with my desktop, you just press the P button. Um, I think there might be a drop down menu for it, um, but I'm just using the P hotkey. Yeah, so if you just go to tools, show parameter dialog is the other way to get it. Um, I'm usually prefer to work this way just so I have more real estate or more space. And then you could resize it if you want. <laughs> yeah, it's too easy. It's, uh, it's hidden somewhere. <laughs> so we're using the VDB to spheres just to fill um, our, our 3D shape here with spheres inside of it. Um, you usually just need to change some of these settings here to get a better result. Usually I'll turn off overlapping so then these will never be intersecting. Sometimes if you're doing this for VDB, um, like a RBD proxy, you'd, overlapping is a little bit more efficient, but just for visual, visually nice looking results, I usually turn that off. And then max radius is like setting the, the voxel size of the largest sphere. So right now the biggest sphere it can, can create will be six voxels. And uh, then you usually just need to crank up the max to allow it to um, use more spheres to fill the stuff. If you make these numbers really high, you can uh, really slow things down. Like, I don't know what algorithms they're using, but with really big numbers, you could get, uh, it could take like an hour or something like that, depending on your, your processor. I might go higher with this max radius, just getting more variation in scale. Much better this workspace. I use it too. I hate to see tons of nodes and work in the corner of the screen. Yeah, for the longer, um, the grain tutorial and stuff like that that I do on YouTube, I'm just working with default settings to try to make them um, the easy, more easily accessible to like the common person. But typically for work, I prefer this like minimal interface. And then as I need more panes and more features or debugging tools, I'll, I'll add them on the fly. So like if I really need to go into the geometry spreadsheet and bring this up, but for the most part, I'll try to work this way as it's just, you have a lot of space to kind of spread out. It's the, abiding by social distancing within Houdini. You, you keep these nodes somewhat spread out. So I might, 
I don't know this min radius. I'm trying to get some. <laughs> trying to get some bigger. I guess I'm, I am getting some bigger ones. It's just that the uh, the shape itself is pretty thin. That it can't find that many big areas to put stuff within. Sometimes these numbers like. Even going bigger, it will start to find a better, uh, better result. But again, it just makes things a little bit slower in the long run. Yeah. So maybe something like this is pretty cool. Um, and then I might like can uh, clip this so we can see inside of it. Um, so to use the clip node, you can't do it on Polygon Soup. Uh, so I'm just converting it. Basically, after you run this convert, you'll have individual faces again. But this Polygon Soup is like a optimization for the viewport and for um, renderers. It's a little bit more efficient to put all of the faces under a Polygon Soup primitive. Um, if they don't have unique attributes, you can do it as like a kind of optimization. We'll do clip. So we should probably already be able to merge these. And get a pretty interesting um, thing happening where we're kind of like peering inside of them. It's like doing a cross section of uh, of a model or something like that, um, even layering these clips. Like if I go to um, above and below, let me get a little ahead of myself here. So I'm trying to do this to make like a little strip exposed that we could look into. So we're using this to cut off the top and uh, using this to cut off the bottom. And then we should have kind of something like that. Might want to flip these around to go the other way. It's possible that what I'm trying to do, I need, um, sometimes you have to switch this to output the groups and then you can manage the um, kind of like intersection and stuff like that. Yeah, so today's it's going to be an abstract result. Um, I was flipping through some stuff from this um, 3D studio called Zeitgeist. Um, so just these different like materials that are really like, I don't know, abstract or blobby, uh, smooth and stuff like that. Um, it's an interesting style. It's kind of like uh, like the architecture somewhat of 2001. Um, oh, they're they're based in Berlin. There's like the the start of this movie. He's in this like interviewing um, facility. Like, can't even spell today. Um, the hell is going on? Cool zone art. <laughs> Yeah, it's generally like last week was a, a bit more realistic than I've done before, but it's usually just kind of abstract 3D art or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm more interested in kind of some algorithmic forms or, or stuff like that. Um, that could, I don't know, something like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes with these clip, like you set it to all primitives and then you have different groups. Um, so this will still draw the, the line. Uh, I think you can see it right there um, where it's cutting stuff. I don't know if that's it actually. Um, it looks like it's down here. This will still perform the clip, but um, it will just keep things in the two different groups. So if I do this and um, you like rename stuff, and, and uh, 
then use like group combine. And then you're kind of setting your Boolean operation this way to do intersection or union or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. I think I should be able to get it just doing it this way. Um, so I was hoping to get the center of it, like kind of see-through or tra transparent. Um, I think I just need to do a merge at the end. That was my, my brain wasn't fully activated. So you just do a merge. Maybe this is a little boring as um, like everything's lined up with the axis. One thing you can do, like I could manipulate the direction here so that it's not, um, it's going, it's not going along a plane. Julian, how's it going? Somewhat late to the party. We, we had a bit of a longer like Q&A session before we got started, but yeah, I'd say we're about an hour in making this. Um, did just some 3D noise, fancy stuff in the bot to get where we are, um, and then doing VDB stuff to fill it with spheres and uh, just playing around with the surface uh, form right now. So yeah, with these clips, one disadvantage is like you, this direction is in a vector format, like it's not rotation in degrees. Um, this is kind of like a normal, or it's like that kind of a 3D vector. So you can use these UI to, to move it around. Um, another thing I'll do sometimes is just transform everything. So if I just spin this shape, um, can spin it and do our clipping. And uh, the clipping will still take place using a straight line, but you can output the transform attribute. Um, and then if you just do transform by attribute, this will know to look for that uh, special attribute. It's a detail attribute. Um, so like last Sunday, we were playing around with the matrix for intrinsics. Primitive intrinsics, this is a similar idea where it's encoding that rotation that I just applied and storing it as a detail attribute. Um, so if I put this at the bottom, by default, it's just reapplying that same transformation. If you go to invert, then it's like undoing the rotation. So if I take these two nodes and disable it, you can see all we're changing is the clipping, the cutting direction. So this would let me rotate stuff in, in 3D space using degrees or whatever. If I want to animate it, I can do it that way. Um, I don't need to like reference these two channels and link them together or whatever. It just depends on how you prefer to work though. There's a bunch of different ways to, to do this same thing. So this is pretty interesting. Um, just gonna maybe try to expose some more of these. I don't know if this top part gets too small. It doesn't make, it doesn't feel connected. Um, so what I might do, what if you did the noise to that old <laughs> trick? Yeah, you could do that if, if you don't want straight lines. Um, I might keep stuff kind of straight right now just because uh, I think it's somewhat interesting to like um, contrast all these smooth round shapes with a, a straight line. Um, I'm just trying to line this up a little bit better. Um, we have a lot of like organic shapes, so getting some straight lines is pretty cool. We could try it and just do it like as a pretty smooth, as a pretty low uh, frequency. Um, so if you just store your rest position, um, just makes a copy of the position attributes and shifts them over to another 
rest attribute. I'll just go into the, the spreadsheet. So all we're doing is making a copy of the point positions into an extra attribute. Um, so yes, yeah, so I might not even do CD for this one. We could just do it with, with uh, rest. And then we can do that attribute noise we were talking about a little bit earlier um, to do like a broad distortion. So I'm just trying to get something that isn't too wiggly. This is just more of a stretching or something like that. Um, so if we do the clip in this noised up distorted space, and then if you just do attribute swap, you can use this to revert back to your position, how it was here. So we've cut, we've performed the cut in that distorted space and then it appears straight right now. But when we go back and kind of undo the, the result of the noise, let's just look at the result, then you'll see we get a little bit of a wave or interesting kind of distortion to it. So this is a <laughs> little bit brain breaking now. We're, we're working in several different spaces. Um, we have this like rigid transformation and then a 3D deformation. And then we're just undoing those transformations at the end to uh, just distort how, how that uh, clip node is, is behaving on things. I might do, let's try it. Yeah, I think this is, we're still getting like some nice straight lines but it's just a bit more interesting, I think, to have some variation in stuff. Um, I might go a little bit wider with this split here. And I might just start um, adding some colors to visualize stuff. So if you do the color, um, Based off of the bounding box, you can just get a typical gradient. Basically, it's just taking the X, Y, and Z point positions and putting them into the color attributes, but based off of their relative position to the bounding box. So we'll, they'll each just be gradients going from zero to one. Um, but this way we could just see a little bit easier like the structure or the form that we have. So there's a lot of Kind of motion and flow to what's going on um i might do like a particle like a, you could do a grain simulation with these because they have p scale um or even an rbd simulation just to have some kind of like they're escaping or they're getting freed like released from the inside of this form um i might save this just to make sure we don't get our checkpoint, our save file. Um, what is this? The VDB to spheres outputs who like Houdini sphere primitives, yes. But um, so it has intrinsics right now that store like the scale, but you can tell it to output P scale. Um, so this is the 14th. And this is, uh, say abstract wavy shape <laughs> we made it pretty far before the checkpoint um there's that the does it should do a pretty good job of saving crash files or, or stuff that's living life on the edge as i like to do um yeah so with this vdb to spheres like it's generally a good idea to add this P scale, just a bit of information. Um, and then if you want to, you can do the add and replace this geometry or just only keep the points 
Um, so now we, we have particles with P scale. Um, and then if you want to go back to uh, what you originally had, you can always add the spheres back on. So it's the same idea. I don't know what happens here with this. Maybe it's just the, the orientation of them was changing or something like that, but it's the same uh, data type. Haha, <laughs> ja ja. No autosave by default. Um, yeah, it, there's um, there's ways you could do the autosave. Like if you just do edit, you can turn it on. Um, for whatever reason, they don't let you like default that on. You can write scripts and stuff that can can manage that for you as well. So the other reason I'm the, the other reason I decided to save was um, I wanted to like play around with the noise, um, the form that we were generating. So I just did that. Usually I'll save my scenes in that manner. Like it's a visual checkpoint, and then I'll try out some other ideas, and I could go back if I really get something I'm not happy with. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go to a lower resolution and I might just try to maybe go a lower frequency here. I'm just going to try to simplify that, that form a little bit. So because I decreased the uniform the uniform uh, sampling size, like we have less voxels for VDB. Um, but I think it's just a little bit visually better. Like your your eyes have less to look at um, with this form. So I could go back up to the sampling divisions. But basically the broad 3D form, like there's more of a clear focal point. Um, whereas before there was like a lot of different areas where stuff could be, uh, interesting areas to look at or something like that. So that this hopefully just visually simplifies things a little bit more. There's still some, some bits of interest, but like, this is the biggest shape that, that you would look at right away. I think, I don't know. I'm not a, uh, master that I still need to look, there is some, uh, compositional concept artists and stuff like that we were talking about last week. I need to, to look more at that stuff. Like Sid Mead and uh, some of the other people that just like sketching and drawing that are really good at laying things down and controlling where your eye goes, how it moves across the, the scene or the, the composition. But yeah, I think I could get keep moving along with this more simplified shape. Um, and then I might just start with a grain simulation for these, just using pop grains, um, just because I think it's going to be the easiest to set up for right now. Like bullet, you need to worry, I would need to make this geometry into proper like convex holes. Um, it's just a little bit more of a task. And then vellum just takes a little bit longer. I'm just making a still frame. Um, that's my intention right now. So I'm just going with what's quickest for me to uh, set up. So if you just do the pop network, um, you might want to do it after we go to the just points, no primitives. Um, and then inside, just do all the points and birth. We're just going to do this on the first frame. So just import the geometry on the first frame of the simulation, but don't keep emitting it every frame after that. And uh, so if you just want to turn this into a grains, it's very simple. You just add the pop grains node. And then we just want to be sure to turn off assume uniform radius. If you want to visualize the result, you can always just do this at the end. This will just visualize the P scale again. Um, so if we just want to test things, see if our collisions are working, a quick way to do that is just doing pop attract. So just move everything to the origin. Um, just bring up the time bar here. 
So generally with the grains on the pop solver, you might need a few more um, sub steps. This is kind of like, I, I talked about this a little bit in the grain, the vellum grain tutorial, but when you just have a lot of particles um, moving quickly and interacting with each other to resolve those collisions, you generally just need more sub steps. You could see that with just one, it doesn't realize it doesn't have enough um, chances to fix all the little penetrations and stuff. So it's just an unstable result of the simulation. So I'm just giving stuff a test here, making sure that it's working uh, properly, but I can get rid of that pop attract if I want to now. Um, I'll start to try to bring in this shell geometry. So if we want this to be a collision, um, I think the VDB is a good way to go. I might be able to just do VDB from particles. So this um, stuff already has a pretty dense point count. Basically going to treat each of these surface points as a um, particle. Or like do this. We just want to do it with um, Treat them like they have a smaller size. So point radius scale instead of one is way too big. Just want to go down to that. Lokesh, thanks for, for hanging out. Yeah, I feel bad for everyone in the maybe Eastern, I don't know what you would call it, um, European time zones get uh, cut off slowly. We'll just decrease the voxel size. Now you can see we're getting like a nice um, representation of the hollow surface. So because this geometry isn't watertight, I don't want to. I don't want to fill it. I'm doing VDB from particles to just treat it like a shell. Um, and I think we can just plug it right in here. I don't need to worry about it being too precise right now. It's like, maybe you could go a little bit lower with the voxel size. Should be okay. And then inside of here, we can just do static objects. And uh, I think we just want... The volume sample so that we could just do proxy volume I'll usually do the up input path expression to fetch that input that I connected things to so I just do this visually like you can see what's uh, connected where you could also reference this using a null or like a just directly tell it to use that node but I'm, I don't know, more OCD or something like that. So we could play it again. It looks like we do have the um, collision geometry working because like stuff is kind of popping because it's like inside of it or whatever. Um, I guess if we want to fix that before we put spheres inside of things, uh, we could do reshape SDF and then erode. So this will try to give things a bit of a margin, like a spacing uh, to pack it. This basically you just offset stuff and it will shrink everything um, uniformly. We could see if this have a little bit less um, explosions. I don't know if um, You can also just move into higher resolution here with a smaller E scale radius to treat that shell as like a thinner shell. Sometimes with this drag, you can reduce a little bit of that 
jittering. Um, another thing you can do on the pop grains, um, internal collisions, I think, if you turn the sniff stiffness down, should start to... Uh, they don't care as much about their... Um, trying to, to resolve the collisions. And then this um, rotation. Basically, if you don't have orientation information, it will try to use the velocity. Um, sometimes I'll just delete that. And then it's a little bit less distracting because the spheres are, aren't rotating around all over the place. I don't know, sometimes changing these um, constraint iterations can sometimes get like more stable results. I don't know, sometimes I also think this, um, this collision stuff, you give it the polygons. Whoops, I did it. <laughs> tied it up in a knot. Um, you convert from the VDB back to polygons. Um, I'm just going to wire that in as well. And then on this node, we'll give it the SOP path that would be the hard surface geometry. I'm not 100% sure because this says use solver default. Um, but I think some of the particle collisions do use like surface-based collisions and they don't always use volume collisions. Sometimes as well, you can force it to switch. You can see everything here is a lot slower because um, I think it's using some of that SOP path. But you could also force it to do surface collisions. Now it looks like it's really slow. So I might go back, just do the uh, solver default. It's possible like the grain solver is using hard surface and then this, uh, it's possible one of these is using one method, one's using the other. But now we've just fixed a little bit of that. Um, it's not a super big deal because again, I'm planning to probably do a still, but just for getting like sensible results, it makes sense to, to try to debug that a little bit. Um, let's see what else we can do. Maybe I'll just do pop force. So we could use this to, um, this will just push it push the um, particles around using like a curl noise. It looks like the default is pushing things down that way. Um, I might just go with the offset and try to find something that matches the uh, directionality of this kind of form a little bit more. Like this thing seems to have this like upward buoyancy kind of motion to it. So maybe if these are getting released just following the form, it, it makes a little bit more uh, visual sense. And it looks like these collisions are, uh, you saw some stuff like poking inside and stuff. I don't know if we do more web steps. There's like some stuff oof, that poked through a little bit. Um, yeah, so let's investigate this. We can go back higher here. If we make the shell thicker, we should avoid um, some of that stuff sticking out. Then we just don't have to worry about it. You could always like fix it yourself, but the more things you can fix it in the simulation, the, the easier your uh, your life will be.
this is starting to be pretty interesting. Um, one, one thing I might try is doing like, you can set the mass of these particles. Um, the mass is kind of like just a scale on the force. I might need to, to add it to the... to the noise, to the pop force. But, so I think by default, like you set the mass to zero and the forces won't uh, apply to things. These are just the collisions that are happening right now. Um, what I might try is setting the mass from the P scale. And I think I'm gonna go in and activate this to use mass. So the bigger the mass or the bigger the p-scale, the more that these uh, spheres should get pushed around. So it looks like by default, it's uh, really making those numbers a lot bigger, but uh, just reducing the, the amplitude is kind of compensating for it. Maybe with the drag, we can uh, have that use the mass as well. And we might have to compensate this one. It's possible I want this going the other way. Um, if you do one divided by the P scale, then that's kind of like an inverse relationship. I think it was good the other way because it looks like right now the big ones aren't even moving unless it's just stuck. You think he got stuck in there? I think it's, uh, might just want to do maybe this exponential one. I don't know, that's kind of causing some other artifacts. Looks like this is a little bit giving me better results. If this was um, like an actual physical simulation I was trying to do for an actual VFX shot or something, I would probably investigate this kind of stuff a lot um, further, like how mass works and its relation to the other forces, but I'm just trying to create something as quick as possible. So I'm kind of just like putting numbers in and seeing the, the result and just seeing what looks good um, right now. So I'm not being super, uh, my lab coat is off today. My smock, the artist's smock is on right now. This is pretty interesting the way that this stuff is like following the flow of this uh, noise feature right here. Um, there's still some penetration. One, one other thing we could do is just like shrink the P scale a little bit. Um, and then that will sort out any of those little penetration issues. What I might do is just go up another version with our save. We start, we're starting to get like an improvement, a good result. So before I mess around with more settings, we're just gonna save it again. And uh, I'm just gonna make the collision stuff a little bit thicker. To try to fix those penetrations. Um, One thing we have to be careful of is that we're importing the collision geometry here. We just want to set this, if you do pop star, then it's only the particle object. 
So we were bringing in the static object before. So it looks like this um, fixed, just expanding the thickness of this fixed. Most of those still have some issues here. Um, maybe I'll do another offset. And then I might play around with this VDB to uh, spheres. Just reduce the counts so that it works more quickly. It's looking nice. <laughs> it's doing something. Um, I might reduce the min radius. We just have more levels of detail. And uh, let's see what happens with this one. This is pretty interesting. It's kind of like you drop this in a bucket of water or something. It's like falling down and, and leaking some air bubbles or something. Um, we might move move into rendering before uh, we go too far down the tweak zone. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I'm just going to save this again and uh, start thinking about rendering. This color, I'm probably not going to keep it this way. Um, I might do something else with it. Something that's a, a weird little trick you can do. Um, if you do a bound node right here, um, you can kind of elongate this with certain directions. Um, and then if you merge stuff in, you're just using a subset of the um, bounds. Like if we look inside of it, this is getting a, a more um, consolidated color palette. That's not all of the colors. It's just a subset of your uh, rainbow kind of. Um, and then if you want to get rid of this bound, like we don't want to keep it. Um, usually what I do is just flip these around um, so this is six primitives right now. And if I do a blast, because I flip these around the primitive order, these will be the starting numbers. So if I just do, um, we want to do it after we apply the color. If I just do my blast and set it zero to five, um, then we're just getting rid of the box. This is a, a weird trick or whatever, but basically you can do this to um, just look at different portions of the, the color palette and get like abstract kind of gradients or whatever. You just type in numbers and instead of this whole thing being the bounding box, you're just saying use a, a subset of the, the color information. It's kind of like a lazy man's color palette hack. I think it's a little too too spread out. Um, we getting some some better stuff early on. This kind of red colors, maybe. Yeah, so I might move along with this stuff. I think this. This kind of angle or something is starting to look the best. 
just conveying the most of what's going on with one view. Um, you kind of have this bigger shapes and bigger spheres to somewhat define like a focal point. And then all this other stuff is just keeping your eye kind of looking in this area. Usually with these cameras, um, I'll go 36 with the aperture. It's like a standard. The color node. Um, so usually color by bounding box um, will do a very generic, typical looking color gradient because it's always just going from zero to one across the shape. But I'm using a, this bound um, and basically merging in this bigger uh, rectangle or bigger bounding segment. Um, so by doing that, what's happening is I'm just saying use a portion, a, a certain subset of the bounding box color ramp instead of the whole thing. Is it kind of a weird, and then the blast is getting rid of it. Um, maybe with the wireframe visualization, it makes more sense. So without the bounding box, you're saying just do a generic color ramp from zero to one. And then if you expand your bounding box, you're just saying use a smaller section of that uh, color ranges. So basically this X or um, horizontal component, instead of going from zero to one across the entire shape, it's going, I'm just using like 0.7 to 0.9 or something like that. So instead of, uh, yeah, just merging it in. So I merge it in with this as the uh, first thing that gets merged into. And the reason I do that is this bounding box will always give you six primitives or six faces of, of the box. And then if the blast at the end, you do it just zero to five because it counts starting at zero, um, then you, you'll know you're just explicitly only getting the bounding box with this. It's kind of a weird trick. It doesn't make a lot of sense to look at it, but it's just for visually just grabbing a segment of the bounding box. Um, you could do stuff in Vex if you wanted to, or like in a VOP to, to just grab portions of a, of a gradient or stuff, but this is just working quickly. It's for me visually, like is a good way to just try out different uh, color sections or palettes or whatever, different color temperatures or instead of always the generic um, thing. It's just a very typical kind of boring Houdini color. You're just getting a little bit more of a uh, interesting color palette, two, kind of like a two-tone. Um, yeah. So up here, I was just changing my aperture to 36. So this is just what you, you, you use to um, mimic like a DSLR or a full frame sensor, you just set the aperture to 36. And then the focal length will be like actual lenses for a camera. So if you move your aperture around, it's like using different sensors that other people, like it's not a regular camera. So I'm usually doing this. And then my lenses here is like a regular camera lens that you're used to if you're a photographer. So usually with Redshift, you can render these as particles. Um, I don't have too many, so I might just bake them to geometry. Um, we go to polygons. We actually have faces. We're still not rendering a crazy amount of, of geometry. The bound fall off is it? It's a mind blowing. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's kind of like sloppy. If if you're doing this for like a big setup to hand off to someone, they might be a little confused by it. You could maybe name things like a little bit more properly, but it's a just working quickly. You're doing colors. It's it's another bit of a gem. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just gonna convert the particles to actual primitives. Uh, and then I can just render everything with the one container. Um, so I'm doing this if I want to add shading attributes in SOPs to the spheres, I can do that. If you just render them as particles, you have a little bit less control over the, the shader and stuff like that. Um, the other thing you can do is a, a little sloppy, but if you want to, you can use like this stash node. Um, this will just make a copy of the particles and put them into your Houdini file. I don't have too much geometry, so you can do it just to make sure your simulation doesn't change. It removes like the time dependency and stuff. Um, you do it with like a frame hold, but this will basically stop like the simulation from recooking or, or stuff like that. Um, you could also just like right click, save this geometry as a BGO or a BGOSC or whatever. But if you want everything to live in the Houdini file, you can do it with this. It's kind of like Maya, how Maya will um, embed the, the geometry into the Maya MB, MA scene or whatever. I might just start with the RS light. I might do it with um, just moving the viewport around. Let's just start with a kind of rim shape. Control click. And now we have a light placed from that camera view. Um, make the redshift node. And I think we, we could see what happens. Um, I was switching a little bit to using this render view just to get a bigger window or whatever. Um, so right now it's a little, we're not getting the shader. We're also not getting like indirect illumination. Well, that's usually the first thing I'll do is turn on the bounce lighting. Um, the light is super overexposed right now. So just right here, the intensity, maybe 25 is like a little bit better. Um, yeah, and then we probably just want a shader. So if you don't have a shader, we'll just use the plastic one, but that will have a mirror kind of no roughness. So it just looks a little kind of nice to give you like a, a bit of a clay preview or like a default look you know you're gonna get, but it just doesn't look that good. So we'll do the RS material builder and uh, you drag and drop with the Houdini viewport usually get it to apply. My OBS, I think it messes up the drag and drop stuff. I might have to do it. Um, we did get it. Sometimes I have to go in and type type in the path or whatever. Um, so I could just do a color just to make sure it's working. Um, and I'm just gonna add some roughness. So now we can control the, the reflection and stuff. And then if we want to get the color attribute, we can just do the RS point attribute. Um, let's set that to CD. Sometimes you have to do refresh to reload the uh, information. It's already looking pretty interesting with um, just the white, the three different colors, pink, white, yellow. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a banana or something. The different fruit exploding its seeds or something like that. Um, might go back into the light. You just have to set this back to the camera. Um, so I'm just gonna lock it and uh, try to get a better rim 
going on. We'll do uh, make the light invisible so we don't see it in the background. Maybe the size. Your RS area light comes with a hundred value for the multiplier. Yeah, so it's, um, I turned it down from 100 to 25. The default for everyone is 100. Um, it just depends on the scale of your scene. Like, the so the size of the light, if I make it smaller, it will reduce the intensity because it's based off of like, like in, in real life, if you have a bigger light, it's going to make things brighter. Um, so it just depends on the scale that you're working at. I think the Redshift developers just haven't haven't dialed it in um but they don't they don't work at the same scale that other people usually work at with houdini but yeah that's why it's always a bit off so I'd, you could just shrink the size as well as changing the uh intensity so if i go down with both of these and then back up to 100 um then you could see 100 still isn't really strong enough to to blow things out um so you, it's, it, all of these stuff is kind of linked. You could always do normalized intensity, but some, sometimes I'll use it if I am changing the size quite a bit, but it just depends how you, how you want to work. Got a final today. The entire cool zone, what are we making? Yeah, it's basically uh, lighting. Any lighting you're doing, the scale of your scene is super important because it's using the inverse decay or whatever the um, just the decay model is like the fall off of, of light intensity is super important for for the scale you're working at. Um, so we're making I'm just playing around, but I was kind of synthesizing some ideas uh, I had before. So last Friday, I did this 3D volume stuff to make like a cave. Um, Today I was moving a little bit more abstract. It's kind of like inspired by some of this zeitgeist. I guess someone was saying they're based out, uh, in Berlin, um, but they make really cool like abstract uh, 3D forms, um, a lot of like interesting material concepts. Um, and I'm kind of combining it with like the grain tutorial stuff I did, with, like VDB to spheres to fill uh, an object with uh, particles. They're local heroes. <laughs> They're the, the rock stars of the of Berlin. So yeah, that's that's how we got here essentially. Abstract fruit mixing burst seeds. Yeah, so it's um yeah, the VOD like it should be available if you you probably hang out live for a little bit, but if you do want to go back, like I think it records it live and you can uh, already like scrub backwards in time or whatever. Um, so yeah, there was some faceting issues here. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can fix that. Um, what I've found to be the simplest, I'm just going to get rid of some of this. Just get rid of the light and camera so I can home the scene. Um, you can go higher with the BDB resolution, or sometimes what I found is this attribute blur. Um, just doing a few iterations of this. You can give it a try and see what happens. Um, do a, a snapshot. Um, yeah, the lighting, <laughs> that's a lot of the, uh, tricks of being a, doing this kind of stuff is like the shaders and the lighting play so much into uh, what you're making. Like this is, it, uh, it really changes stuff quite a bit. So you could see like certain, certain areas are getting, um, looking a little bit better with those artifacts. Um, it might just be the, the resolution of things as well. So like, I don't know where I would want to do it. Um, 
maybe like right here. You just do a layer of subdivision. Um, and then keep doing the smoothing and everything. I don't know. What I might do is a different method. So we split this off. I don't want to change the spheres that stuff is getting put inside of. I just want to change the, the results for this surface we're making. Um, so I'm just going to take this chain here and do VDB resample. And then you can use this to do voxel scale. Um, reduce the voxel size this will increase the the resolution of the detail of things so the voxels are closer together they they uh we just have more detail you go from started with uh a million voxels now we're a little over two million and then with more voxels you can do like a smooth it's kind of like the blur or that kind of idea and uh we should start to fix some of these um, crunchiness or whatever. So I'm doing the higher resolution and stuff. I don't want to change a lot of the form. I just want the same silhouette and stuff. But just fixing those pieces. So it looks like it did shrink stuff a little bit. It didn't mess up my composition. Like we don't see any penetrations. So I think we're okay. If you if you want to um, still fix that, like you, you might want to render this stuff as a subdivision surface. Um, you can also play with the normal node. So you probably want to do this like at the end. Um, but instead of like vertex angle, if you do face area, sometimes that will fix those like grid artifacts. It's definitely better than uh, than it was before. So I might, um, trying to think what I can do to the spheres. Um, I might just do like a, maybe we'll just do it with a bop. So if we just take one of these directions, um, we could do like a noise or something based off of this, just to do like a interesting ramp somewhat. So we have these lines going across everything. We could try maybe a different direction. Maybe like the height based noise could be uh, somewhat interesting. It's kind of showing the, the buoyancy or like we're, we have the, everything going in like a somewhat upward direction right here. Let's just see what it looks like. I'm gonna get some water. I'll be right back. Looks a little too dark.
So these are going, <laughs> this is the water, the thirst emote. Um, so these are a little too dark in, in a lot of areas. Um, let me go to the rock. I'm gonna turn on the SOP level updates. Uh, so we should be able to change these colors kind of in real time or automatically. Um, it's IPR, top level updates. Then when we update the color information, it should get it automatically. And uh, I think what I want to do is maybe like absolute value so that we don't go below zero. Let's see what happens. Might just be this area of the noise <clears throat> is quite dark. And I think our lighting is also just a little too um, too much too too much mystery. So I'm going to add a somewhat of like a fill light. So maybe something just from the side right there. Definitely seeing this banana. <laughs> this, this yellow form is pretty cool. I think I uh, might want this stuff at a higher frequency. Let me just switch this to uh, <clears throat> just the spheres for a second. So I think we want to clamp the values so that we don't get stuff that's brighter than one. I think I want more like resolution in the mesh. I'm trying to decide if I want to do this at render time inside of the shader or um, I might switch. I think that's gonna be easier to do. So this, this, um, Output right here, I'm just gonna do the hard surface stuff. And then I'm, I might actually switch this to doing particles. We'll do null. This will be out particles. Um, so this, <clears throat> we can do some special shading stuff at render time and just get more uh, detail. I might switch this thing around. Um, Dolly, <laughs> this is kind of Dolly-esque uh, sagging clock. This is an octane look. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just build out these particles to make another geometry container. It's gonna be wavy. And uh, this one will be Particle. 
Dali-esque. So now we can do redshift particles, render as particles, and uh, we don't have to worry about having enough like subdivisions and stuff like that. Um, it could be an animation. It's kind of set up where I could move some stuff around, but usually with these these things, like sometimes it will animate, but I think I've found in the past that it's too too short of a time window, or for me, it's I'm not at that skill level yet. Uh, I try to do the whole project just in this time slot. Um, so I, I've generally just worked towards the still because it's a, a little bit easier to uh, to accomplish that in this time window. So now this everything should just run a little faster. So Redshift is uh, quicker to load and then I can make another shader and uh, control the particles separately in, inside of the shader. But yeah, I mean, the way that I see it, these these are like just ideas or concepts or drafts. Like you, it would be a first pass as like to figure out a look or an idea that you like, and then you could think about more, maybe the way that you've set it up, it's, it's very convenient and you can just render more frames and you'll get a, a motion. Sometimes you might want to like rebuild the setup and maybe instead of doing grain particles, I might want to do like RBD for these spheres. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just like working with abstract, making these abstract things. Like you can't really sit down and sketch everything out because it's such like a unknown form and everything. Um, so usually I've found like drafting using SOPs and some simulation if you need it. And then once you get something that looks cool, then you can start to think about how to uh, simulate it. Like the other guy that kind of does a lot of stuff like this is uh, Vincent Schwenk. Um, he might have enough practice that he can do this stuff very easily, but like the way that I would think about it is he's probably starting with like a still frame and then adding motion later on, like thinking about how it might uh, how things might need to be set up just cause like the solver simulation stuff is so technical and time consuming that it kind of breaks your like creative uh, flow for a little bit. So unless you sit down and like storyboard stuff out ahead of time, um, I think you kind of just have to do like I'm doing now and do like a draft or sit down and, and uh, sketch, plan things out a little bit more. Hopefully that makes sense. So yeah, we set up the second shader. Um, so this, our, our particles are still white, but we can do um, that same idea we were doing with the noise, um, but just do it inside of the shader. So if we do the max on noise, um, might need to be. If we do the max on noise, then we're getting this um, result. And then I was just stretching it. You have a little bit less control. Um, in the redshift shader than you do in Bops, but we should still be able to get um, a similar idea happening. So these, I think the scale stuff might <clears throat> might work a little bit differently, like than I was doing in Bops. It's kind of inverted, I think. But this is uh, getting this a similar idea happening. And then there's other noise types you could play around with.
we could just put this into the color and then we'll actually get some of the lighting information um might want to do this change range just to remap some of those values freaky fridays this is our little d wavy mango poggers this is the exploding fruit um yeah i don't know what uh i think this black the darkness is kind of uh Maybe we'll just go down from 0.5 and 1. So we'll just have gray and white instead of black and white. You liked it? You like the dark? Good, uh... Do something like this, maybe. Maybe this bottom <clears throat> the darkest i don't want it to be completely black because that will like clip out kind of like it won't uh reflect any light this is pretty interesting um maybe these are more like rubber or something so it'll make the roughness <laughs> yeah it's i don't know it's hard to like these look really cool by themselves but if we're saying this is like a, this lovely fruit it's a little bit weird maybe to to uh i don't know um i think i want more <clears throat> more stretching and stuff happening here so basically i spent all this time switching this over to a shader uh, based noise so that we could have a lot more resolution and stuff the caramel swirl might even be too much uh... just a bunch of lines kind of I think that's a more simplified pretty cool So this original light, the rim light, I'm just going to try making that a little bit bigger. Um, I might, <clears throat> I might try a different direction for this noise. Rich, how's it going? Thank you. Yeah, so. Figuring this stuff out. I don't know about this other, uh, we take the same noise and, uh, incorporate it into this. You do like everything monochromatic, um, Neapolitan ice cream. I think they have it in, in New York. It would be most known, isn't there? Um, Neo, there's Neapolitan ice cream and pizza. Those are both. Those are both a, a certain specification. So maybe here with this noise, I might just try it as like a bump map. Um, so we'll just have some kind of striations or something like that. The collider with the noise and particle with the two-tone. Yeah, that I think that would be a little bit more uh, a better composition. 
Let me see what happens here. Yeah, I think it's a little weird uh, having the, your eye is like the particles had the saturation and this was grayscale. It would be visually easier to see. Isaac, how's it going? We're, we're lost, <laughs> lost in the sauce right now. Um, this is bump map, just smack it down. The default settings is way, way too high. Um, yeah, and then I think we should switch the the gradient. Uh, so that's happening to the particles, but not uh, not the collider shape. So I think I could go back into here. Just put in the color. Um, and I, I'm not sure, but I think we can take... I think we can still do the coloring. Um, there's like a subsurface on the particles. Yeah, that could be nice as well. Kind of like a very delicious looking, uh, very appetizing looking coloring palette. Um, so yeah, I think if I just do the same idea here with the merge. Um, and then color. And then the blast. We should be matching the same colors with those particles. Let's see if it worked. I think it worked. You could always like color correct them or make them uh, more saturated. Whoa, <laughs> it's too, too delicious. Let's, uh, <laughs> the pog slider. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, it is looking more, more edible. Um, the subsurface I think is a cool idea as well. Chocolate, chocolate shader on the wavy. <laughs> yeah, so I might do this. I think it was a little bit too smooth before for the, the specular was too uh, crisp. Um, I don't know. This does make it feel it's more like a gusher. <laughs> you guys ever have the gushers candies? Makes it feel more liquid. Yeah, let's, uh... is there a st starting point you do for the chocolate? Milky coffee? I don't know about that. Maybe just, uh... maybe just this diffuse color. Like Godiva. You see what it is now? <laughs> the timeline of chewing gum. <laughs> I think this, uh, oh no, I didn't mean to click. I, uh, I was trying to close my color viewer. Um, I th think that this bump map, we could push on it a little more maybe. This is like the pressing pattern you do on the uh, the stamp for the chocolate stuff. Maybe. Just have it not as bright. Or I'm, I'm not as uh, frequent with the scale. Let's 
so yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I think it's starting to be something. Um, I don't know if... I don't know what kind of like environment this kind of thing would be in. Um, sometimes I'll just do the dome to do like a background color. So you do it right now and it's actually the marble museum. <laughs> the marble candy palace. Sometimes um, this light, you just use it as a background color if you just do objects um, and then enable the light mesh associations and switch it off for everything. Now it's kind of just like you're making a background color for the renderer. Um, you'd still get dome maps. You have them saved somewhere. Um, I think I have some that are like, I just want somewhat of a, a lighting studio. Let's try this softbox tent. I'm just looking for something that's like, it's not changing the uh, the lighting on the object, but something that's a bit of a background, like a, you're imagining that there's something back there, a piece of paper or something. Just the, the lazy way of uh, putting a, an image behind your, your uh, shape, essentially. This thing it might have gotten a little bit too bright. Might move that that first light around a little bit more. Yeah, I think the chocolate could use some subsurface. I don't know if it's going to work because it's a, it doesn't have any thickness. We might need to do the uh, VDB trick to give it a bit of uh, thickness. This is pretty cool. So this bump map, sometimes you can push it, you get like anisotropy kind of look. Um, yeah, I think this lighting is starting to be a little bit better. Um, I'm going to zoom the camera in a little bit. Maybe just like the 50 millimeter. Yeah, and then I think we could build out, uh, <laughs> the sauce, the sauce is flowing. Um, this might be a little bit too much of a crop. Um, yeah, then we can do the thickness for the, is it like salmon, eggs, <laughs> caviar or something? <laughs> the, this the specular, uh, the glossiness or whatever is, makes it feel a little bit like little jellies or something. Um, yeah, I think we could do the thickness for the chocolate. So I could just grab those same nodes, I think, earlier. We're doing VDB from particles and then converting it back to polygons to uh, make everything have some thickness to it. Lint. Lint. I don't know that. That might not be a, they might not have that chocolate in uh, 
This is like Lindor. We have like Lindor truffles or Dove chocolate. So now this stuff just has some uh, thickness to it. And then we can do subsurface. The Easter staple. Uh, I think I've seen. Yeah, I, I've seen the wrapper before. I never. I never. Uh... There it is. <laughs> so yeah, the subsurface. Um, I, I guess overall we're doing like a very dark luxurious dark chocolate um i'm not too too sure how the subsurface i guess the radius we want it a lot smaller and uh everything is a bit waxy It's a bit more uh, delicious. Let me take a look at these particles. I think that the radius of the subsurface was a bit too big before. It's like half half of where we were. <laughs> Let's do zoom depth of field. Yeah, maybe doing a macro look at things could could make it just more interesting. Um, I don't know if this background super delicate. Do a viscosity flip simulation or something. The drips. Um, maybe let's try turning this light back on for everything. We'll just get some more reflections um yeah i don't know it might be Too many numbers. Let's uh delicious. Let's go let's punch the zoom. So we'll turn on depth of field. Um and then we can start to uh do some macro shots. And then with Redshift is really nice. You have the uh, quick to focus. You don't have to play around with uh, the sliders and stuff as much. I don't think Mantra has this feature. So I was always going in and like manually uh, adjusting that. I think it makes more sense with the background a bit knocked down.
rendering beers. <laughs> it's time to click submit to farm and crack the beer. I've never used aperture maps. I didn't know if that was a. I didn't know that, that was a possibility. Like sometimes I'll use the bokeh. Is that what you mean? Just the shape defined by a texture? So, um, those are quite nice, I've found. Like, to get the the center to be more bright and stuff. Or you, you could get it the other way. Um, yeah, this image. So, one thing I do usually change is the aspect. Um, to be like a anamorphic. Yeah, the col yeah I, I think I do have some that have some color shifts. So... Somewhere in here I have them. <laughs> yeah, I think Mantra and our in Redshift, I guess they all uh, support it. Let's try out some of these. Yeah, so if you have like a the bokeh image or bokeh, buka, um, you just give this uh, map or the texture to the render, and it will. It's not. It's a little bit closer to a camera, but it's not. Uh, we're at chocolate now. Yeah, we went. To, we we switched over things, so we got rid of the gradient from this collision shape and moved it to the particles. Um, I think it just helps your eye like find, figure out what's going on a little bit better. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Boca maps is super nice for making it like more photographic. You could also increase the power um, and that should like, kind of like doing a contrast, I think, like the sharpness of uh, crunches the kind of like texture up a little bit. I don't know if my, uh, just go super. I feel like I'm pushing it too far or something, or is it? My depth of field isn't going exactly where I'm cl clicking. It might be with the particle geometry, it like is a little bit harder for it to uh, evaluate that surface position or something. I think I'm just going to to. Uh, too powerful with my <laughs> let me just go back to this The jelly stuff should be, yeah, it's a little, uh, a pretty interesting frame right here. It's in a, it's in a bit of a weird territory where it's like not uh, blurry enough or not sharp enough. But yeah, also with the the bokeh, it should make that a little, a little uh, more clear as well. Yeah, 
you can change the normalization. Uh, okay, so you're not like throwing off the the camera exposure. Yeah, I think some some of them it was uh, it was tossing me off a little bit with that. So I'm just going to try to move the focal point a little bit. I think it was pretty good where it was. I guess you could do like a color color ramp here. So this is like chocolate drizzled, like a caramel color, but I think it's okay for, for right now. Um, you might just play around with the light a little bit. I think this composition and stuff is pretty cool. Maybe the other one. A little bit cleaner with uh, just one main like spec hit, I think. I think my uh, IOR was a little bit too much like glass before. Put it on, I, I like it on the chocolate right now. It feels like, um, uh, I don't know, like, sometimes you see it where they drizzle the uh, stuff and then coat it afterwards or something. But um, you try adding it to the, Kind of, I don't know, something like this. I don't know. Um, you try adding it to those, I think. Sugar, sugar time. 
I might uh might maybe try this refraction. This streams makes you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe like a blurry refraction. I feel like the. Where did it go? I guess that's where the only place the color was coming from. Um. I don't know if you're meant to layer those in this order. Maybe I should be changing like the refraction color. Um, maybe we'll just try somewhere in between. I might change that noise just so it's not as uh, high of a frequency. I think it's like a bit too repetitive or, or uh, too eye-catching or whatever. I'll just save it. Um, I'm gonna play around with the camera a little bit more. I just wanna save this composition and stuff. Maybe seeing like the slice, whatever, the explosion. Might be the chocolate is like too uh, too dark. Closing that one by mistake. Now you're cooking with gas. <laughs> yeah, I think, I don't know, this is a pretty interesting macro view right here um might get close to leaving it here just gonna have a quick rich thank you for the twitch prime i appreciate it saw you uh recommending that parsec screen uh remote i think it's parsec I it might have been slightly different sounding but uh i, I want to try to look into that I was using like, you just figured it out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, they don't do the best job. And I see recently they 
rebranded it to Prime Gaming or something, so it makes even less sense now if you're like looking at a Houdini stream and you talk about gaming. It's a bit weird branding or whatever. But yeah, I'm looking for alternatives to... Uh, I'm using TeamViewer, but I feel like that's just a bit... I don't know. They're like... They give you too many ads and they're pull, they pull too many weird maneuvers on you. But I looked at that Parsec website, it seemed like it, it might be a little bit better. So yeah, I'm just gonna go in with this photographic exposure. Yeah, I saw someone was asking about like the color representation and stuff, but for me, I'd use it. I use it mostly remote stuff, just to like manage render tasks or like do simple like manage simulations or stuff. But uh, yeah, just something that's like reliable and free is uh, ideal for me. The, the overall like quality of uh, colors and stuff is less concerning. If I'm going to be doing remote, I'm I'm probably not going to be like color color correcting to to that degree. Um, yeah, we'll play around with this a little bit more. This, this stuff here ended up pretty interesting. Yeah, might leave it here. I don't know, this is a little bit too uh, too crushed. But yeah, this is uh, probably gonna be it for, for today. Sorry again about Wednesday, had to uh, Take it off, focus, get some other stuff done. Um, we'll be back tomorrow, um, Saturday and Sunday, the regularly scheduled programming. Um, we'll be putting this uh, scene file in the Discord if you want to play around with the luxurious, delicious uh, caviar uh, abstract treat or whatever. Um, We'll be in the Discord, so there's some gems possibly in the stream. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the uh, people subscribing, gifting, hanging out early on. Uh, we had a nice like Q&A session before we entered the cool zone. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll leave it here and uh, hope people <laughs> satiate their hunger sorry if i made you too uh craving of sugar with this stuff today um let's be back tomorrow doing some more typical kind of uh learning type of stuff all right thanks everyone <laughs>